up? It is Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies, and we are getting closer. We are finally close to the 2020 NBA Draft. This is the NBA Draft Junkies show on the Nothing But Net channel on Dash Radio. And I am so looking forward to getting this draft over. I feel like I've been talking about these players and evaluating film for over a year now. I'm looking forward to 2021. But let's get 2020 out the way. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Hit the like button, share, comment, do whatever. Now let's get right into it. With the first pick of the 2020 NBA Draft, I think the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to select LaMelo Ball. I'm not a big fan of the fit. On my last mock draft, I had Anthony Edwards going number one. I think with D'Angelo Russell... And Carl Anthony Towns, you need a wing. Even though the NBA does play a lot of dual point guard systems now, but I just don't. I'm not. I just don't think this is a good fit. But I get it from the standpoint of Lamelo has a really high upside. He's box office, and to be honest with you, the team is up for sale. And I think Lamelo and and the buzz that he generates could actually help as far as finding a, a potential buyer. We saw what the Jazz sold for last month, so. I imagine Glenn Taylor are looking for a similar type sale. So anyway, but let's talk about the basketball aspect of it. As far as the pros, again, you get a six, seven point guard. There are not many guys that can do what LaMelo Ball does with the basketball. He is an absolute wizard when it comes to his passes. And he's a six, seven point guard. The cons of this pick are, like I mentioned before, I don't know if he's a good fit. And then defensively, you know, Minnesota was... Not a really good team on defense last year. Their two best players, like I mentioned, Cat and D'Angelo, aren't known for being good defenders. And then you add another guy like Lamelo, who was one of the worst defenders in Australia last year. So they could be going all in on offense. But again, I, I get why you can't pass up a talent like Lamelo, and I understand the the business aspect of it. So I think Lamelo Ball goes number one to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Number two is the Golden State Warriors, and this pick has been like the first pick in a lot of trade rumors. I've seen Wiseman being selected number two and being moved along with Andrew Wiggins and Minnesota's first round pick for 2021. For Bradley Bill, I've also seen like the number two pick to Chicago for number four and Wendell Carter. I mean, I imagine draft day is going to be crazy, but just for the sake of right now, I think the Golden State Warriors would select James Wiseman. He would be their center of the future if they keep him. He's a guy that was projected to be number one on a lot of boards at this time last year. He's a freak. I mean, he has great length, athleticism, and I think the pros of this pick for the Warriors are you get your starting center, you get a a potential rim protector, and you get a a young player that you can groom who doesn't have to come in and and be like the face of the franchise. He can just kind of blend in and learn. I think the cons of this pick, I think it just depends on the, the type of player Wiseman chooses to become. Now, there are signs that he likes to settle for jump shots and he wants post touches and he relies on a fadeaway. I think that can be good, but I would much rather see Wiseman as a a rim runner, vertical lob threat that gets a lot of points off of, you know, just being active as opposed to someone that settles for contested jump shots. I thought Sports Illustrated had a, a very good article on him. And they said that he likes to play like LaMarcus Aldridge. Nothing wrong with playing like LaMarcus Aldridge. I just don't think Wiseman has the the shooting touch as Aldridge. I want to see him as an aggressive player that gets to the free throw line that just puts a lot of pressure on defenses with his activity as opposed to settling for turnaround jump shots. Not saying that I'm against him developing his jump shot, but I'd rather just see him use his size and, and, and skill set advantage as opposed to just kind of settling. So number two, the Golden State Warriors, James Wiseman would be my choice there. And with the third pick, I have the Charlotte Hornets selected Anthony Edwards from Georgia. I think Michael Jordan would be thrilled to have Edwards fall to number three. 
There have been rumors that Jordan would like to move up for James Wiseman. It could be smokescreen. A lot of stuff that you're reading at, at this time, you just don't really know if it's true or not. But I think Edwards and Charlotte would be a good fit. I mean, I think that he gives them help on the wing. He gives them an additional score and, and a score with high upside. I mean, if we can get the Anthony Edwards that we saw against Michigan State, then then Charlotte has a superstar. They have an NBA all-star. The question marks about Edwards or the cons about selecting Edwards are his defense. You know, there are some questions about him playing on winning teams or questions about his role. Um, you know, can he play if he's not dominating the ball, his off-the-ball shooting? But, again, he's a 19-year-old kid. I think everybody has a lot of question marks entering this draft, but I think Michael Jordan and Charlotte will be thrilled to have Anthony Edwards come in because I think that he could provide some excitement and – They've, they've had some unfortunate picks. I mean, you've had Cody Zeller. You've had uh, Michael Kidd Gilchrist selected in the top five, and those guys didn't necessarily pan out to be franchise changers or even all-star caliber players. So Anthony Edwards, in my opinion, has the highest upside of any Charlotte draft pick that we've seen in recent memory. So it should be a no-brainer for Charlotte to select Anthony Edwards. Now we're on to pick number four. Now, this is where they say the draft officially starts, gets tricky. Everyone is kind of expecting, in, in no particular order, James Wiseman, LaMelo Ball, and Anthony Edwards to go into the top three. But now I pick number four with the Chicago Bulls. And Chicago is like one of a few teams that whoever they select is going to be redundant. Whoever they choose possibly doesn't crack the starting five as a rookie unless they make some trades to free up some roster space. But if I'm Chicago here, I'm selecting Denny Avdi at number four. I like Chicago. In my opinion, and people are going to think I'm crazy, but I felt like Chicago was one of the best jobs. It, well, for me, it would have been the best job. If I could have had any job this offseason to take over as the coach or the general manager, I would have chose the Chicago Bulls simply because of the challenge I mean, I like the city, and I, I think that they have a nice pool of talent to work from. But they had so many injuries last year. I like Kobe White. He averaged over, like, 25 a game in the last 10 games of the season. I like Zach Levine. I don't understand why his name is mentioned in trade rumors. He's only 25 years old. He averaged 25 points a game. And I, I think he's still young, and he could develop into a player that plays some winning basketball. Because right now... Winning is kind of like the the negative on his resume. Winning and, and defense, obviously. Otto Porter missed a lot of games last year. I'm a really big fan of Lloyd Markkinen. He averaged about 19-9 in 2018-19 season. He dealt with some injuries last year. Wendell Carter has dealt with quite a few injuries from a thumb to a abdominal muscle to a severely sprained ankle. He's only played about... 86 games maybe in his first two seasons. So with all that being said, I'm selecting Denny Avdia. I think Avdia could be a good fit in Chicago. Now there are some concerns, and the biggest concerns I have are if he's not going to be used as a playmaker, then I think you kind of limit how effective he can be. If you put him in the role where he stands in a corner and is expected to knock down open shots, then I don't think you've utilized his skill set. But if you give him the opportunity to play with the ball, make plays out of pick and rolls, then I think you maximize his talent. But there's a chance that the ball may not get a chance to get to him with Kobe White and, and, and Zach Levine. Both guys are, are known for getting their shots up first. But I still think Avdia would be the, the good pick here. I don't really know another direction they would go in unless they make a trade. If I were the new general manager of the Bulls, I'd keep this roster intact. I mean, I just feel like they didn't have a – a lot of opportunities to play together, and with this extremely long break that we've had, they should be healthy going into camp. And I would I would see what they can do before I make any moves, but Avdia would be my pick here. I don't know if he breaks the starting lineup. I think in an open camp, Otto Porter still ends up being a starter. And the few games that he's played for Chicago, he's shot the ball extremely well, and he's been able to give the Bulls a, a role player guy that doesn't need a bunch of touches. And so I think Avdia could come in and be a six man and and just kind of make the Bulls better because I personally expect the Bulls to be 
the most improved team this year outside of Golden State in New Jersey, or I mean Brooklyn. But I think the Bulls could push for a playoff spot, so Avdi will be my pick there. All right, now moving on to the Cleveland Cavaliers, and this is another team where whoever they select is likely going to be redundant. Unless they select the wing, you know, they could go in so many different directions with this pick. If they chose a point guard like Tyrese Halliburton or Killian Hayes, I wouldn't be shocked um, because they, they, they really need to add another playmaker or add a playmaker to their roster. The ball just didn't move. They had two score first guards like Chicago, but their score first guards are a lot smaller than the Bulls. Also with their front line, I know Kevin Love and Andre Drummond are on the roster. It's still undetermined what will happen with Tristan Thompson. And I don't know if Andre Drummond is in their long-term plan, so they could look to add a center like Okongwu and just kind of have him play behind Drummond for the year, at least the start of the season until they move him or until free agency. I haven't really heard a lot of rumors about Kevin Love being on the trading block, which is kind of weird because he's a guy that you know he can't be in Cleveland's long-term plans. But the trade front on Kevin Love has been quiet. So with all that being said, I still think Kevin Love has moved, and I think Obi Toppin is the choice here. I think he's ready to come in and contribute right away. I've said it before on quite a few of my podcasts that I believe Obi Toppin is the most NBA-ready prospect in this draft class on the offensive end of the floor. There are a lot of question marks and concerns about his defense, which I totally understand. But I think Obi Toppin could add some excitement to Cleveland. You know, he went to school in Ohio, so to me that may play somewhat of a role. But I think for Cleveland, they're... They claim they're challenging or or they want to make the playoffs. So I would go Obi Toppin here. But I don't know. (laughs) It's it's a tough choice because I'm just not a big fan of the pieces they have on this this roster. And so it will be interesting to see if they can get some some decent trade pieces or if they can get some assets for, for Kevin Love. So Obi Toppin at number five to the Cleveland Cavaliers would be my choice. All right, another tough one at number six for the Atlanta Hawks. Atlanta was, I mean, they were bad on defense. The worst team in the NBA on defense, 119 points per game. And it seems like their rotation is pretty much set because it's a lot of redundancy there. What they don't have, in my opinion, is another playmaker to play besides Trey Young. Trey Young had a heavy offensive load. Cam Reddish in theory, is supposed to be a secondary playmaker. Um, DeAndre Hunter is supposed to be a pretty decent passer. They could go in a lot of directions here. I honestly don't think they keep the pick. I think this pick is moved simply because, I mean, it's redundant. If you draft a center, you just made a trade for Clint Capella earlier this year. Capella's young. You draft a four. John Collins was just drafted a few years ago. He's up for an extension. You draft the wing, you already have Cam Reddish, DeAndre Hunter, and Kevin Herter. And if you draft a point, you know he's not going to come in and start. So, again, I think this pick is moved. But in the case the pick is not moved, I'm going with Devin Vassell here. Vassell would give the Hawks another three-point shooter. He would give them a very good defender. I think he's the best team defender in this draft in Atlanta. Needs help on defense. But I believe in his upside. I really do believe that he has a high upside. I think he needs to get stronger and improve his ball handling. But I think he has an upside that he could potentially be a Paul George type player. That's his ceiling. And, you know, a lot of players don't reach their ceiling. But that's just what I see. But I think at the minimum, he could end up being a very good 3 and D guy and someone that just kind of contributes to winning basketball. But again, I do not think the Atlanta Hawks keep this pick. I think it's on the move. We've heard rumors about New Orleans for Drew Holiday. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, (laughs) Yet, I get it. I mean, Drew Holiday would improve their defense and give them a secondary playmaker and kind of relieve Trey of his offensive duties. And and at the minimum, he would be a vet. I mean, this team is extremely young, and they like veterans. So I get why Atlanta would have an interest there. I don't know how I feel about it. But I think Atlanta is going to try to make the playoffs this year. I think with adding Nate McMillan and having a healthy Capella and John Collins playing the whole year, they should be able to improve on the defensive end. But 
Devin Vassell at number six will be my choice there. All right, the Detroit Pistons. Detroit needs pretty much everything. Blake Griffin is another name that's been mentioned in trade rumors. I've even heard Blake Griffin to Golden State. I don't know how true that is. But to me, when I look at Detroit's roster, I I see they need a lot of things, like a lot of help. This roster is almost like a blank canvas in a sense. Resigning Christian Wood would be priority number one. And then I would just kind of build around Sekou Dumbuya and... Yeah, but right here I would go with Killian Hayes. I think Hayes could be the point guard of the future coming into the season, which ironically starts like within the next month or so, you know, give or take maybe six weeks. I think that uh, Derrick Rose will start the season as their starting point guard, but I don't expect Rose to finish the season in Detroit. Killian can come in, learn from D. Rose for a few months before he's handed the keys to the offense. I personally... I'm a big Killian Hayes fan. I just like him as a playmaker. I think he's a better defender than he gets credit for. As far as the weaknesses for Hayes, he needs to work on his right hand. And there's questions about his outside shooting, but I think he has some shot creation ability. And again, he's a, a very good playmaker. So that would be my choice at number seven for Detroit. As far as other directions they could go, they may look at uh, Tyrese Halliburton. They could even look at Anyeka Okongwu who I'm a really big fan of. Um, if they move Blake and maybe they feel like Christian Wood is a four or him and Okongu could play together, that could be something I could see happening. So I don't know, but I just think Killian Hayes would be the, the best choice here for Detroit. Now, this is probably the toughest pick because I just don't know what to think about the New York Knicks. This is a new front office, new coach. I believe Tibbs wants to somebody that can come in and contribute right away. He wants to win now. On one hand, I can see Tibbs wanting an Isaac Okoro type player, a physical defender that just comes in and plays defense with, with the toughness. I think he's a Tibbs guy, but I don't think that he helps them short term. I like Okongu again there, but I think they seem to be all in on Mitchell Robinson. And Knicks fans love Mitchell Robinson. I mean, you would think he's the next coming of Wilt Chamberlain or, or, or Bill Russell. I'm curious to see how he fits in with Tibbs because he's going to have to learn how to stay on the floor. He's a little raw defensively. Potentially, he's 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 got the goods, but... He's a little raw on, on the defensive end of the floor. In my opinion, I think they need a point guard. They have quite a few on the roster, but I'm going to go with Kyra Lewis here. I think that he brings a lot to the table. Speed is one thing that you can't teach. I think he's a, a good choice for New York because it seems like the fans are just over everyone they have on the roster at point guard right now, so they're looking for a fresh new start. Another player that they could look at at number eight is... Tyrese Halliburton, maybe. I don't think he would be a good fit in New York simply because the roster just isn't strong enough. I'm not as high on Halliburton as others because I think he's more of a complimentary piece than an engine. And I think with New York, they need an engine. They need someone that's going to be able to manufacture points for himself and others. And I think Kyra Lewis fills that void. So at number eight for the New York Knicks, Kyra Lewis. All right, moving down to number nine for the Washington Wizards. This is a no-brainer. This is probably the easiest choice that I've had to make this far outside of the top three. Onyeka Okongwu, he is someone I had number three on my last mock. He's not sliding for any particular reason. And that's not like, you know, I've heard negative things or I've seen a bad workout that has him sliding. It's really just kind of the way the cookie has crumbled in this draft, but... In Washington's case, Okongu fills a need, in my opinion. They were a bad defensive team, and Okongu will be able to come in and be a, a, a vertical lob threat. He'll be a rim roller, and he'll be a switchy defender that can also protect the rim. I really like Okongu, and I think this would be one of the best fits for him. If not the best fit, he should be their opening day starter, and he gives John Wall a vertical lob threat. I don't recall Wall having a vertical lob threat like Okongu since 
JaVale McGee. And, I mean, that was so long ago. That was back when the Wizards wore blue uniforms. That was, like, right at the end of the Gilbert Arenas era. So, Anyeka Okongu at number nine. I know he kind of fell a little bit from my last mock. But I, I'm still a big fan. I'm still high on his upside. And I think for him and Washington, that would be, like, a perfect marriage. So, Okongu at number nine to Washington. Rounding out the top ten is the Phoenix Suns. They were the hottest team in the league in the bubble. They won all their games. And it just makes you wonder, like, if DeAndre Ayton didn't miss all those games for the, the drug test and they just won a few more games, they could have been a playoff team. I know they have to be excited in Phoenix going into this season. And you got the rumors about Chris Paul coming to town. I think Chris Paul, along with Devin Booker, that would make Phoenix one of the more intriguing teams to watch next season. So with number 10, I would go with Tyrese Halliburton. Again, I mentioned earlier, I'm not as high on Halliburton as others, but I think in a situation like Phoenix or even Washington, where he can complement a team that already has a star, I think it maximizes his talent. I don't think he's an engine. He's not someone who I want to run pick and rolls for. I have a lot of concerns about his inability to get downhill or get to the free throw line or shoot pull-up jumpers. But if you have another player on the team that does that, then Halliburton is an ideal fit because he's a very good outside shooter. He's a good ball mover. And he's a high IQ player that I think will contribute to winning basketball because I would hate to see him go to Detroit or New York. And then I just think all his flaws and and weaknesses are exposed. But in Phoenix, he doesn't have to dominate the ball or be the engine because we know Devin Booker is everything there. And Halliburton could just play off Booker and knock down open shots and swing the ball. Perfect fit. I mean, Couldn't find a better fit for Tyrese Halliburton than the Phoenix Suns, in my opinion. Again, you are listening to Rafael Barlow with the NBA Draft Junkie Show, the Nothing But Net channel on Dash Radio. Down to number 11 with the San Antonio Spurs. And when I say it is weird as hell to see the San Antonio Spurs in the lottery, I mean, like, (laughs) it's been a long time since the San Antonio Spurs have been in the lottery And I've read all the rumors saying that San Antonio is going to make something big or a big splash. I've also heard about LaMarcus Aldridge for the number two pick. DeRozan to the Lakers for a package involving Kyle Kuzma. And I don't know what to think or what to expect. So it's just tough to predict what San Antonio will do because they really don't have a track record of selecting in the lottery. But in this case, I have them selecting Patrick Williams from Florida State, one of the youngest players in the draft. And I know if San Antonio does indeed select Patrick Williams, there are going to be a lot of comparisons to Kawhi Leonard. Now, I will say that it is unfair to Patrick Williams to be compared to Kawhi. It is a a good comparison. I mean, it's something that you, you definitely like because Kawhi is... Definitely not a bad player to be compared to, but I just think the expectations would be pretty high. Williams is, is, uh, he's the modern day wing. Like, I think a lot of teams are looking for a wing that is switchy, that can defend multiple positions. He should be able to rotate between a three and a four. I think a lot of teams see his upside as a shooter. He does show some ability to put the ball on the floor, hit the pull-up jumper, and also make plays for others. I think this is the San Antonio Spurs fit. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with LaMarcus Aldridge, like I said. And I think San Antonio should really embrace rebuilding. Like, you know, you look at this roster, and I just think they need to just start from scratch. Be bad. Have a first-round pick in 2021, which is supposed to be a much stronger draft. Possibly 22, which is supposed to be the double draft. If San Antonio was still trying to hang on and and make their playoffs next year, then I think long-term it really hurts them. So in my opinion, trade Aldridge, trade DeRozan, try to get some assets, go younger, let some of the young guys develop and play a lot of minutes, get a good pick in 21, 22, and then start from there. But like I said, man, we don't know. We, We just don't have a lot of reference of what San Antonio will do or because this is just kind of unfamiliar territory. So Patrick Williams at number 11 to the Spurs would be my prediction there. 
Moving on down to number 12, this is a player that has slid about six spots from my last mock, and it's Isaac Okoro. I had him going number six to his hometown Atlanta Hawks in mock draft 3.0. And now, unfortunately, I have him going to the Sacramento Kings at number 12, which is probably not the best position to be in, maybe not the best fit for him. Sacramento is a team that, like others I've mentioned earlier, there's a lot of redundancy there. I think at, they're set at point guard with De'Aaron Fox. At the two, depending on what they do with Buddy Hill and Bogdan Bogdanovich, I imagine one, if not both of them, will be there at the start of camp. At the small forward spot, you have Harrison Barnes, who I think is more so of a four in today's NBA. You have Marvin Bagley at the four, who is, you know, he's shown – a lot of upside. He's shown flashes of the player that Sacramento was hoping to get at number two. I think the sad part about it is he will always be known as the guy that was drafted ahead of Luka Doncic. So that's kind of unfair to him because that had absolutely nothing to do with him. Now it's a front office thing, but that front office is gone. That's a whole different story. Rashawn Holmes is, I guess, projected to be their starting five. I don't think there's anybody here that Sacramento should reach up to for at the five spot at this pick. So Isaac Okor will be the choice there. If he can develop his outside shot, then you have a strong defender, secondary ball handler, playmaker, guy that generates a lot of fouls and can defend all over the floor. In my opinion, he just wasn't confident at times in his shot. And in today's NBA, if you have a guy that is – not looking to shoot or can't knock down shots. It kind of messes up your offense, no matter how good of a defensive player he is. I think the days of Andre Roberson playing major minutes on a team going on or looking to make a deep playoff run, I think those days are over, especially in the playoffs. I have faith he can knock down open shots. I think if he can just become around league average, then he ends up being a high, high caliber starter think he has first team or second team all defensive potential but it's all depends on his outside shot don't be surprised if sacramento looks to make a trade i mean i've seen the buddy hill rumors to philadelphia i've seen that the bucks want bogdan bogdanovich i don't know what to expect out of the kings but isaac okoro is the pick here at number 12. this is another difficult team to gauge because this is just a difficult draft, and it's so much smokescreen going around. So many, I don't know. This is one of the weirdest drafts that I can remember. But at number 13, I got the New Orleans Pelicans selecting R.J. Hampton. I think that Hampton has one of the highest upsides in this draft. I mean, he is basically a wing in size. He has... Freakish athleticism, crazy speed, crazy first step. It's between him and Kyra Lewis, in my opinion, as the two fastest players in the draft. And then RJ could swing between the one and the two. I don't really know what position to label him as. I just label him as a ball player. And if New Orleans is looking to move Drew Holiday, then I should open up a, a guard spot where RJ can play alongside, you know, if, if Lonzo Ball is there, he can play alongside him. I've seen the rumors of a Drew Holiday and Kimba Walker swap, which doesn't really make a lot of sense for me for New Orleans unless they think Holiday is going to be gone and they're going to lose him for nothing in free agency and they just want a veteran guard there. I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. but And the Pelicans do have quite a few guards on the roster. I mean, they have Frank Jackson, who they just drafted a couple years ago. You have uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. I, I, I get his last names mixed up, <laughs> but they have him who they drafted last year, who I think has the potential to be a pretty good player. They also have the, the draft and stash guy that played in Australia last year that may be coming along. So there is somewhat of a log jam at guard, but I think if Holiday is gone and then maybe they're looking to just really go young, then I think RJ Hampton would be a good fit here, especially with his speed. Like I like speed, speed kills. And I think RJ has a speech where he can break down the defense and create open looks for his teammates. 
And it would be tough to stop a RJ Hampton and Zion Williamson pick and roll. But the key for RJ, like quite a few other guys in this draft, is knocking down open jumpers, shooting off the dribble. I've actually been in the gym, and I've seen him work on his jump shot. The kid has put in a lot of time and a lot of work on his jumper. Only time will tell if, you know, the, the jumper that I've seen him knock down and make consistently and, and workouts translates to the games, which if I were a better man, I'm, I'm betting that it does. But R.J. Hampton at number 13 for New Orleans, in my opinion, is a steal because he was projected to go in the lottery, high lottery at this time last year. And his stock kind of dropped a little bit because he played in New Zealand, which is weird simply because, you know, it, it helped Lamelo's, but it seems to have hurt R.J. We can talk about that and, and discuss that on another show. But again, R.J. Hampton to the New Orleans, New Orleans Pelicans at 13 would be my choice here. Now we're rounding out the lottery, and Boston has, as of today, three first-round picks. And this is the first of the three first-round picks at number 14. On my last mock, I had them selecting Precious Achua. I've been going back and forth with if if that would be the right choice there, but I've switched it up, and I think Tyrese Maxey, not because he would be a good fit for Boston's roster for this upcoming season. It's just I think that this pick will be moved, and I think it will be packaged to possibly New Orleans, like I mentioned earlier, but I just don't see them keeping it. I They just have too many guys, in my opinion. But Tyrese Maxey, just in case they do keep it, would, would be my choice here. I think if he is the choice, then he could come in and, and learn and maybe take some of the minutes from Brad Wanamaker. I think that you could play him as a backup guard. I wouldn't say a point guard, but he kind of fills that role as a ball player. I think Marcus Smart could be your backup point guard. You could possibly play Marcus Smart and Tyrese Maxey some together in the second unit. And Maxey defends. He he gets out and he's aggressive. He defends. Very creative scorer. I'm buying his shot, improving. I think he's a better shooter than the numbers have indicated. But I just love his ability to finish at the rim. Man, he is such a creative finisher with amazing touch around the glass. If you had a chance to watch him play, so many different finishes, wrong foot finishes, touch shots, floaters. I think that he's going to be a big-time scorer in the NBA. And if Boston decides to keep this pick, then I think it makes sense. But, again, I do not believe that the Boston Celtics are going to keep this pick at number 14. The Orlando Magic are next on the clock at number 15, and my choice here would be Aaron Neesmith. I could go in a variety of directions here. Uh, point guard could be a need. And... You know, depending on how you feel about Markel Fultz, Orlando could look to to fill a need at, at point guard since Michael Carter-Williams and DJ Augustine are free agents that could possibly move elsewhere. You have Evan Fournier who picked up his option, but he may not be in their long-term plans. So if, if Fournier leaves, then you, you definitely need help at the wing. And shooting was an area that I thought Orlando could have used help in last season. And who better to fill a role for wing shooting than Aaron Neesmith? He shot a ridiculous 50, I think it was like 52% from three last year. That is ridiculous. I mean, I know it's a short sample size, but if you look at the degree of difficulty on his shots, they weren't just catch and shoot standstill shots. He was shooting on the move, pin downs, action plays. I see him as a guy that is going to play a long time in the NBA because he is a sniper. And in today's NBA, wings that can knock down shots and score on the move are so valuable. For example, Duncan Robinson of the Miami Heat. Now, Aaron Neesmith is not as big as Duncan Robinson, but I felt like Robinson created a lot of opportunities for his teammates in Miami just because defenses had to pay attention to him shooting off the move. There's not too many guys in this world that can shoot, running full sprints under the basket, to the wing, catch, shoot, set their feet, knock it down like Duncan Robinson. Neesmith has that ability to do that. So if you pair him with, let's say, Markel Fultz, and then you 
you know, maybe next year he's on the floor with Fournier. But if he's able to knock down shots off movement like that, it will open up Orlando's offense quite a bit. Aaron Neesmith at number 15 to the Orlando Magic would be my choice here. Up on the clock now is my favorite team, the Portland Trail Blazers. And this pick is a no-brainer. Maybe I'm biased. Maybe I was saving him. But Sadiq Bey from Villanova fills so many needs that we have in Portland. I shouldn't say we as if I'm on the team and I'm on the roster collecting checks. But I'm a Blazers fan. Been a long-time Blazers fan. And Sadiq Bey, to me, is just a perfect fit. He gives the Blazers a outside shooter, another defender. I think that he is a very good wing defender and another playmaker. I think his passing and playmaking skills are so underrated. And I look at this Portland roster, and I think on opening day, he could be the starting four. They're probably going to try to force feed this Zach Collins and Yusef Nurkic lineup, but to me, that's not going to work. I would start Trevor Ariza at the three, Sadiq Bey at the four. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and we're still days away from the draft. But Sadiq Bey would be my choice in Portland. It's something that, like I said, I've wanted, and I think he fills so many needs. And Portland has to hit a home run with this draft. I'm a fan of the Blazers' development, but I think Sadiq Bey just, again, fills needs as an outside shooter, additional ball handler another playmaker, and a defender that can guard multiple positions, which is something that we haven't really had since Aminu left and Harkless. Ariza only played with Portland a short amount of time, and he missed the bubble because he had some personal issues. But Sadiq Bey, the Portland Trailblazers, number 16, is my choice, and I'm happy to make it for Portland. At number 17, I have the Minnesota Timberwolves selecting Precious Achua from Memphis. I'm a big fan of Precious. I had him at number 14 in my last mock. He drops three spots here. But, again, I'm a big fan of Precious' game. So much so that I think I'm starting to become a little biased because I have some friends that are so anti-Precious that I've been defending him so much that it's made me like him a little more. But I like his baseline of skills. I think that he can defend multiple positions. I think that in the right system, with the right development, he can be this 4-5 hybrid that can rebound and push the break. A rim runner, a guy that you can use in pick and roll. And in the best case scenario, a player that can shoot league average from three but also put the ball on the floor and attack closeouts and become a matchup nightmare for opposing centers. That's my best case scenario for Precious, but even if he just ends up as a role as a hustle energy player that is a plus defender, I'm sure Minnesota or any other team that selects him would, would take that. But Precious at at number 17 is my choice for the Minnesota Timberwolves who, you know, there's no way that Minnesota should bomb this draft. They should either end up with Anthony Edwards or LaMelo Ball, and they should be able to find a four that can come in and contribute right away. So only time will tell, but number 17, Precious Achua, Minnesota Timberwolves. Number 18, now this is a pick that I think would be a great, great pairing for the Dallas Mavericks, and it's Cole Anthony. Number one, because Cole was a projected lottery pick coming into last college basketball season. He was arguably the best point guard in this class from probably since he was in ninth grade, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th. And coming into last season, I thought some people had him higher than Anthony Edwards. And I wouldn't have been upset because I thought that that was a, a fair assessment. And his stock has plummeted for him to fall to 18 to the Mavs I think it's a steal so what I like about Cole Anthony and the fit in Dallas is he is a shot maker he's a scorer and he doesn't have to play point guard I think the biggest concerns about Cole Anthony are his ability to play point guard to get others involved and to run a team and his finishing in Dallas he doesn't have to worry about either one of those in my opinion obviously Luka is the point guard there 
So your playmaking, that whole responsibility goes to Luka Doncic. And Anthony was a very good shooter off catch and shoot. He did not have a lot of off the ball catch and shoot opportunities, but he was very efficient when he had the opportunity. And in Dallas, he will have a lot of those opportunities. I feel like that's the third time I've used that word in the last 30 seconds. But another thing that Anthony provides that Dallas was lacking, in my opinion, was a guy that can just go out and create his own shot and get buckets. I think that's something that Anthony does well. It is his greatest asset. And then I feel like the issues that he had finishing at North Carolina won't be there in Dallas because in college he faced a crowded lane because North Carolina didn't have any shooters. And in Dallas, he'd be surrounded by nothing but shooters. So Cole Anthony to the Dallas Mavericks, perfect fit in my opinion. I hope he falls there to Dallas. I live in Dallas, and I would just love to see Luca pair with another shot creator. And I think Rick Carlisle has done an excellent job with with guards and just allowing them to be creative and score in the system. Cole Anthony, Dallas. If Cole is available, make that choice. Number 19 is the Brooklyn Nets. It's a team that is in the news a lot lately. And I'm hearing James Harden to the Nets is a possibility. How do you defend that team? Is there enough basketball? I don't know. I'm, I'm a big James Harden fan. I want to see him win. I'd prefer to see him win in Houston. I don't want to see him leave. But in the case there is a trade between the Houston Rockets and the Brooklyn Nets, then Jared Allen would very likely be in that deal, which if he is, or even if he's not, I think Jalen Smith would be a good fit for the Nets simply because the Nets don't have a big, that's a floor spacer. I know Allen tried it a little bit two years ago, and they gave up on that after a few games. DeAndre Jordan is definitely not a floor spacer. I've heard rumors that you can see Kevin Durant at center from time to time. But I think Jalen Smith would give the Brooklyn Nets a, a weapon that they don't have on the roster, which is a big that can knock down shots and space the floor, rebound, block shots, or whatever. So if I'm Brooklyn, I would take Jalen Smith, even though... I think the best fit for him would be the Pelicans at number 13, but I haven't taken RJ Hampton. All right, numero 20. This is the same as my last mock. I got the Miami Heat selecting Tyrell Terry. Miami will possibly lose Goran Dragic to free agency. Um, Kendrick Nunn, I, I like him. I, obviously, he had a, a very good rookie year. Then in the playoffs, you saw like he went from starting to not playing. And then he ended up playing in the NBA Finals. I thought he did decent there. But I think Miami would need to address their need at point guard, even if Dragic does come back on a short-term deal, which I don't know if it's possible. But Tyrell Terry, we've seen the, the videos that he's gained weight and he's gotten stronger and his athleticism has improved. But I feel like he would be a good fit in Miami because he's a floor spacer. And that's one thing that he does is knock down threes. Him and Tyler Hero would be interesting to watch because they're both very confident guys that like to shoot threes in transition. But one thing I like about Terry is on the outside, he may look a little scrawny and player, but he's got some toughness to him. I, I saw him attack the rim at his, I don't know what he weighed last season, but he was light in the pants, but he was still aggressive. And I think that's the type of player that, that Miami likes. So Tyro Terry at number 20 would be a good fit for Miami, in my opinion. Number 21, Philadelphia 76ers. Basically a new front office, new head coach. <laughs> we uh, don't really know what to expect. I imagine that there's going to be some turnover in this roster, heavy turnover. I just don't think it'll be in the very near future, but I could be wrong. This is Daryl Morey that we're talking about. However, I have them selecting Malachi Flynn. I think Philly needs a point guard in the worst way. I think the Ben Simmons experience at the point will likely end once they make some moves that frees up some space at the four. But I think Philly just needs a point guard in the worst way. Malachi Flynn had a great junior year at San Diego State. He was the Mountain West Player of the Year on offense and defense. His greatest asset that he brings to the table is he's a great playmaker and he just is a good decision maker. Great court vision on a pick and roll. I imagine Philly will run more pick and rolls this year than they ran last year. 
But again, I don't know. This Daryl Morey Doc Rivers fit is kind of interesting to me. So don't really know what to expect. But I do know Philly needs a point guard. Malachi Flynn would be my choice there. At number 22, we have the Denver Nuggets. And this is a pick, in my opinion, which is all that matters at this point because it is my mock draft. Josh Green is a no-brainer pick simply because Denver is ready to win now. And I think Green, his defense is somewhat underrated. Like, you know, when you hear about the guys that are the best defensive players in the draft, you hear a lot of Isaac O'Coral, you hear a lot of Devin Vassell. I don't think that Josh Green is too far behind those guys. I think Josh Green would be able to help Denver right away. We saw how much of a difference Gary Harris made when he came back for Denver's defense, and I think adding a wing like Josh Green helps out Denver's defense um, a lot simply because they give up a lot of points. And in the playoffs, I felt like they really struggled with guarding Donovan Mitchell, which, again, a lot of teams do. And they were just one shot away from being eliminated by the Utah Jazz. So I think adding another wing defender helps them out because you're going to need someone to guard the Luka Doncic's, the Donovan Mitchells, and Kawhi, and all those guys out west, James Harden if he stays, and having a guy like Josh Green to defend stronger wings. And if he can knock down open shots, which he did at a pretty efficient rate in college, but if he can continue to make strides on his shot, that could be a very good pick for the Denver Nuggets. So Josh Green at number 22 to Denver. At number 23, it is the Utah Jazz, and the wait is over. People are probably watching this wondering, where is Alexei Pokashevsky? Finally got him off the board at number 23 to Utah. Utah is a team that is not shy about having international players on the roster. I feel like they can be patient with him. And Utah has had some success with international players, most notably Rudy Gobert, who was railed thin when he entered the NBA and he was passed up by a lot of teams. And if you can redo that draft, Rudy might go at lowest number two. And a lot of people are comparing the 2020 NBA draft to the 2013 NBA draft. And if you can get the, another real thin kid out of Europe and develop him into an all NBA type player, it's something that if you're the Utah Jazz, you're hoping that you can duplicate the success that you have with Rudy Gobert with Alexis Pokashevsky. I've seen the kid play in person. He is extremely talented. Just from a skill set, he is one of the most talented players I've ever seen because he has a unique blend of skills and size and fluidity. He needs to get a lot stronger and he needs more games under his belt because he's playing in second division Greece right now. But Alexis Pokashevsky to Utah and a draft and stash move to me makes a ton of sense. All right, we're getting closer to the end. Up next is the Milwaukee Bucks at number 24. Very easy choice for me. Desmond Bain. I don't know if he gets by Brooklyn at number 19, but Desmond Bain to the Milwaukee Bucks makes a ton of sense. Bain is NBA ready. He is a four-year college player and arguably the best shooter in the draft. That's what he does, knock down shots at a very high rate, over 40% for his career. He gives Giannis a floor spacer and just a guy that you can't help off of. So Desmond Bain to the Milwaukee Bucks at number 24. I think would be a great choice if he's available. Again, I don't know if he gets past Brooklyn at number 19. Number 25. Now, this pick is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And Oklahoma has a ridiculous amount of picks in the next six drafts, I believe. So they can swing for the fences. And here, Jaden McDaniels is the obvious choice for me, at least. McDaniels is an elite talent, crazy skill set. He may remind some of Kevin Durant in build as far as just like how he looks physically not not in skill set but McDaniels is highly skilled he can shoot he can dribble he can score on three levels he has a high upside as a defender it's just a matter of fit and and finding a role I believe in Oklahoma City's development plan so I think J.D. McDaniels at number 25 I think would be a good choice because he's in a situation where he's going to a, a strong front office and a team that has Nothing but time to be patient and wait for him to develop. So 
Jaden McDaniels, 25, to Oklahoma City. All right, with the second of their three first-round picks, it is the Boston Celtics, and I think Boston has a lot of players on their roster, not enough minutes. Whoever they select is going to be redundant to a position that they're already deep at. I mean, their biggest need is center. Boston could look to address their need for some size at 26, but I think Lee Andrew Balmero is too good to pass up. He would probably be stashed for a couple years. He's playing in Barcelona right now, 6'7", Argentinian playmaker, who I think is a good defender. I think that his biggest weakness is his outside shot, but he is a phenomenal passer. has a little bit of flash and flair to his game. And I see him carving out a pretty nice career as a role player in the NBA. Number 27 is the New York Knicks. And I think Xavier Tillman from Michigan State is a Tibbs guy. He's older than a lot of the guys in this class. He has this toughness, like this this Michigan toughness. You know, a lot of these guys from Michigan have this, this Midwest toughness about their game. And that is Tillman in a nutshell. He's a pretty good passer. I think he has potential to end up developing into a, a decent floor spacer, but I think this is a Tibbs toughness pick. And now number 28, which now goes to the Oklahoma City Thunder because of a trade that they made with the Los Angeles Lakers, which is not really official yet. It can't be official, so I guess on draft night, it will still be the Thunder's pick, but it's going to the Lakers. I have Oklahoma City selecting Teo Maladon. Again, the Thunder are... In rebuilding mode, they have plenty of time to rebuild. Maladon is, a, I think he's going to be a pretty decent game manager, floor general, high upside, should be able to defend multiple positions. Maladon is coming off a very successful youth career in France where he's won on nearly every level. He was successful in the French Pro A League and even got some EuroLeague minutes last year. So Maladon could be the replacement for Dennis Schroeder or Chris Paul. But I think the Thunder are, are just in a very good position to gamble on talent here. All right, number 29 is the Toronto Raptors. Toronto could possibly lose Fred Van Vliet to free agency. I read that he's looking for the bag. Maybe Toronto pays him, which I think it would be wise to pay him. But if they don't, then go for a Fred Van Vliet clone and Grant Riller. Grant Riller is a bucket if you haven't watched him play this man is fun to watch buckets upon buckets upon buckets he's a creative offensive scorer one of the best finishers in college basketball he's a little older than a lot of the guys in this class but he's mature he's ready to come in and contribute right away i see him as a guy that will have a, a good career as an off the bench scorer that can just come in and get buckets because that's what he does so at 29 i have the toronto raptors selecting Grant Riller. And finally, with the last pick of the 2020 NBA Draft Junkies Mock Draft 3.0, I have the Boston Celtics addressing their need for size. Wouldn't be shocked to see this pick moved because Boston has too many first-round picks, not enough roster spots. But Isaiah Stewart, Isaiah Stewart was also a player that was projected to be a high lottery pick coming into the season. Didn't have the success that a lot of people expected at Washington. He didn't have a bad year by any means. I think he's a little bit undersized in a sense, even though the league is going smaller. His, he just has a throwback game that, in my opinion, if he played in the 90s, he would have been top 10 pick at the lowest. But Isaiah Stewart can come in, and one thing that he will provide is energy. And a lot of energy, and a lot of energy. He's a good rebounder, active player. Brings a toughness that I think will, will be a good fit in Boston. So that is my choice for the Boston Celtics at number 30, Isaiah Stewart. Thank you for bearing with me as I complete this Mock Draft 3.0. Again, this is Rafael Barlow with the NBA Draft Junkie Show on the Nothing But Net channel on Dash Radio. Stay tuned. I have more content coming for you. I, I won't make any promises, but we're a few days away from the draft, and I definitely have quite a few videos that I plan on unleashing before draft day. So thanks again for staying tuned. Thanks again for listening. Rafael Barlow, NBA Draft Junkie Show, and I am out.